So next we have Roland. Some things in common. Sticking stuff between formwork. But rammed earth and rammed chalk is a bit different. And Roland. Roland Keeble. Um, give us a five minute warning. Give you a five minute warning. If, I'll stand up five minutes before. Okay. <clears throat> Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about various different so I'm going to show you a few projects which are all in the in the southeast in Kent or in Sussex. Uh, you can't see me. If you stand under the light. Sorry, I like you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm going to wear different hats and show you projects that I've worked on, but also talk about a, a kind of wider context to. Uh, to earth and earth building because um, round earth, which is what I do, is just one of, uh, of a family of materials that have uh, clay as a mineral binder uh, which connects them. And uh, this family of materials does all sorts of different things from um, finishes to uh, insulation materials to load bearing structures. And they all work very well together. I was actually um, on a stand at EcoBuild a couple of weeks ago, Alex is next door, um, there's timber guys on the other side of us, and, and, and one of the things about these natural building materials is that they work very well together. Uh, they're a good fit. If you start putting plastic finishes onto hemp, you get problems. If you start putting uh, um, you know, foamed uh, materials against earth, you can get problems. But put hemp and earth and timber together and you, you'll find that normally the result is a happy one. Um, so <clears throat> in my normal talk, each one of these little uh, um, uh, images leads to uh, a whole set of different images and um, I could be talking to you about, um, I could be talking to you about Mali or I could be talking to you about China, or I could be talking to you about work we've done in Cornwall or in the or in the Northeast. Um, but I've got this little bit of time and so on. So, but I think the sort of general point that I that I'd like to start off with is that you have these two chunks of energy around construction, and the first chunk of energy is about the con is about the building of a building, and the second is the energy in use. And uh, different materials have different properties in how much energy they take to you to the, in the building of them, and how much they uh, absorb in the in the life of the building. So <clears throat> there's there's quite a you know there's quite a strong thing. Alex alluded to it that that you can make you know highly um, uh, um, sustainable low energy buildings in use, but you're using materials which are making a lot of emissions in their production. And for us, uh, or for me in particular, cement is the big one because it's 14% of all the CO2 that we make as humans is in the production of cement. Okay. It's, a, it's a really very big figure and it's not in the transport of the cement or in the, in the use of the cement, it's just in the burning of that uh, uh, lime mineral. So anything that we can do to reduce that is important. That's the way I uh, look at it. And it's a, I'm not going to talk about cement for long, but I mean, it is an extraordinary material and you can, you know, you can build twin towers. The issue comes really, uh, if you build the twin towers and the twin, twin towers last for a thousand years, then you've kind of justified the energy that you've used in the production of the materials. But if you take the twin towers down after 30 years with a with a high-flying, uh, fast-flying object or, or just because you don't like it anymore, right, which is basically what happens where, where, where I live in, in East London, then you haven't justified the use of that high-energy material. Likewise, if you're building 30 storeys, we know you can build 30 storeys in, in timber. Okay, let's say, if you're building uh, 130 storeys, probably you're going to be using concrete, and there's really not much of a way around it at, at the moment that we can see. But if you're building four stories, I can build four stories without using concrete, okay? 
And so from my, from my point of view, you really need to justify why you're using cement to do something that I can do, because I can do it without the emissions of the cement. So that's kind of how I see uh, um, building materials are to do with energy, energy in the building and in the use. So I'm going to just show a little bit of the stuff that we do, which is uh, a little bit about how we're, how we're building, but also about the, uh, the discussion of the energy in use. Um, so, um, I don't do a lot of housing. Um, it was a decision that I came to when I came back to working in the UK at the end of the 90s that um, uh, if you build one-off houses, they tend to be more expensive and it tends to drive the cost of the materials up uh, and the perception of the cost of the materials up. Um, if I could have come in and started building 100 houses at a time or 50 houses at a time, then I would have thought about it. But I knew that wasn't really going to happen. So I've concentrated more on, um, on public buildings. And the thing about public buildings is that you can go and have a look at them and you don't have to pay for them. You can go in and work there or visit and come out again and have a little think about what you've seen and what you've experienced. So it's a, it's a lower risk for people to understand what's happening. But this is a house, or the beginnings of a house, um, it, just outside Peacefield, which you can see is built from um, chalk. And this is chalk, just on the chalk clay boundary. So this has a small uh, percentage of clay in it, um, which has doubled its natural strength of chalk. Um, so this is the site, and the site has got chalk on it, so uh, these walls are being um, dug up uh, and the site reshaped, remodelled from being um, chalk in a horizontal form to uh, chalk in a vertical form. And most of what I do, probably 70% of what we build is uh, the material is sourced at site. We might have to bring in a percentage of clay or a percentage of sand to, to change the mix, but essentially we're digging material on site. Um, uh, and, um, and then we're putting it into and um, we're putting it into a formwork. This is a commercially available formwork, this is a commercially available uh, uh, piece of kit, and it's being operated by three guys from Lithuania who don't speak English. Okay, and they're and they're working for a and they're working for a contractor, and so we have to get that information about how to do the work across in a site situation because these are materials that don't come with a uh, with a kite mark. They're not, they're not a British standard for chalk that you've dug up on site. So it's really about the operator. Um, and so one of the att attempts that for me or the work that I do is to see how we can put a technology like this into a regular construction company. Uh, up until the mid-2000s, I ran a, a subcontract, and we'd go out on site. But it, it became, um, I'm London-based, and so I'd pick up a workforce in London, and I'd take them up to the northeast of, of England, where the labour cost is much lower. Um, and so then people would be paying um, a, a higher cost for something which lo locally would, would, be, uh, would be lower cost. So there are all of these issues. I thought that's what changed the model of the way that I work now. Um, uh, it, this was, we were building, you can see there's no leaves on the trees. I seem to remember that this is kind of November going into December. Um, and so it's raining and so there's covers uh, prior, to the, uh, prior to the roof going on. Um, and then this is, uh, most of the, a lot of my pictures are of building sites because we kind of go in, go in right at the beginning, the foundation happens and then we build the walls and then we go off site and then somebody does all the nice pretty things and, and we never get to see the finished thing. So you can see there's quite a sort of clutter of, uh, of builder's material there. Um, little details of laying stone into... Uh, a, a formed channel. This is just a, 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 like a splash detail on the outside. This this building 
is unusual in that the wall is on the outside rather than on the inside, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but it led to issues about thinking about how to detail against, uh, against weather. You can see, um, again, what Alex was talking about, a good hat and boots, in this case the, the roof which uh, overhangs the wall uh, keeps it dry. Um, <clears throat> but then, uh, if you walk along the South Downs Way um, uh, out of Barrison, then uh, you'll pass this long chalk wall. I went and looked at it um, a month ago, and it's actually looking quite nice. Uh, this was built in, I think this was in about 2006 that this was built, and it, you, it's, it's still looking in, in quite nice uh, uh, condition. So. Uh, so it's not that you can't build houses, but typically I haven't. It's not work that I've particularly chased. Um, whereas this is a public building um, just outside Dover, and um, <clears throat> and this is this is kind of work which is interesting to me because lots of people go into this building and uh, look at it and think, oh, ah, you can build with chalk, and then they they go out again and, and take it off into their into their um, everyday life. So this, this pale blue here is the channel, so we're about a quarter of a mile from, uh, from the sea. Um, and this uh, double height structure, uh, on, the, on the outside face here, this is a line render, um, and then you can see a lot of windows that um, um, uh, are actually a really high quality timber window, although they do look quite sort of white and plastic. Um, and um, so say this is chalk again, so it's a very pale colour. This is pure chalk. This crushes at um, um, 0 0.8 newtons per millimetre squared. Okay, now, any engineers amongst you will gasp and say, how can you possibly build with such a weak material? Um, it's, not really the, it's not really the strength of the, of the material, it's how you design for it. So, if, if you say to the engineer, um, uh, this is our crushing strength, design the wall to allow for that, then they can do that quite easily. But the way that um, the construction industry typically has gone is that, uh, that, is that uh, materials are designed to a particular strength, and then they're used in applications which never use that strength. So you've got to You've got a house brick which is crushing at you know seven newtons millimeter squared, and you're building a single story with it. You know it's it's, com it's complete overkill. And I would sort of say, well, this is a, a bit like uh, building um, you know four cars out of titanium. You can do it, but you just never would because the amount of energy and the amount of cost in that titanium makes it uh, uh, ridiculous. But we we we're doing that same idea with with cement, with high energy materials, to build very, very simple structures. Um, this particular uh, structure, is, it's double height, uh, two stories, and it has these big domes uh, on top, big masonry domes on top, and then there's a couple of hundred uh, millimeters of soil on top of them to form the green roof. So they are um, load bearing, um, and hence the, and, and they're also quite weak, the material is quite weak for the engineer, so these walls are uh, 600 millimetres thick. Um, but uh, for us, we would always, we have to anyway make this, um, this form work, whether the wall is 300 thick or 600 thick or however, uh, however deep it is. And in this case, we're producing on site, or the design is producing, about 700 tonnes of spoil, of material. So either you've got to find something to do with that 700 tonnes, um, or you're paying landfill to get rid of it. So making thicker walls in this case was in a way a benefit to the, to the site because they're actually saving quite a lot of money trucking it off site and paying the landfill. So again, we're just using a, um, a commercial concrete formwork system. Um, on the outside, it's built in facets of 1.2 meters by 2.4 meters, which takes uh, a standard insulation uh, bat, and on the inside, um, the curve is much smoother because that will be seen. And we've actually lined it with um, a sheet of ply, and we're back to the same kind of setup. In this case, we had five people on site: uh, digger driver, 
couple of people in the box and a couple of carpenters because making the curved form work is a little bit more complicated. But essentially, this is a wheelbarrow, right? It's just an automatic, automated wheelbarrow. Um, and then someone with a shovel who's making sure that the finer material is uh, being placed up against this um, uh, front face. And then um, a pneumatic tool. So that's each layer of moist soil, not wet, but moist soil um, is, is laid in at about 150 millimetres uh, loose and then it's run over with a pneumatic tamper. I'll show you a little bit of work later where it's been done manually. The soil doesn't really care whether it's been uh, tamped mechanically or manually as long as it's at the optimum moisture content, it's probably somewhere around 10%, um, uh, it will compact to its optimum density and its optimum density equals its optimum strength. So the denser that you can get the material the stronger it will be. Um, so these are, this is a chunk of wall, this is like six meters long and two and a half meters high. It's taken as a day to build and it's standing up uh, um, under its own weight on the day that it's built. So although the material is weak in that sense, uh, it has uh, an inherent strength. Um, so these are just kind of basic details that will tend to build one wall and then a gap and then another wall and then a gap and then another wall and then we'll come back and fill in the gaps. So if there's any tendency for the material to shrink as it dries, the shrinkage of this one and the shrinkage of that one happens already. You've just got the shrinkage of the, of the fill section to worry about and typically you don't have to worry about that and particularly in chalk because chalk has a very low modulus of shrinkage. Chalk hasn't got clay in it, so um, in some ways it isn't a soil at all because uh, because soil has clay. In it. Uh, but uh, but anyway, we can use it as such, and uh, the fact that it's not as strong as a clay-bound soil is to do with the fact that it doesn't have clay. In it. And if you add clay to it, you can double, triple, quadruple the strength just by adding a powdered clay to it. Um, you can see we're doing sort of some quite complex geometry here. Um, I can't remember if you talked about cost, Alex, but, uh, but it, you know, it's one of the things that people want to know. What does it cost? And, um, and there's a sort of an assumption that if it's a new material, it's going to be vastly expensive. And it can be. Um, or, or, on the other hand, it can also be much cheaper. And there is no definitive answer to the question. In this particular case, we, um, this was the last big job that I did as a subcontractor, and I charged £160 a square metre. And, um, and at the end of the job, I discovered that the closest quote in brick was £500 a square metre. So that's really sick, I can tell you. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, we actually made quite good money on the job, and I, you know, I could have I I retired. Uh, if I've just charged £400 a square metre. But anyway, this is the things what nerds. Again, there's covers here. The covers are being taken up every day and then brought, taken down over the tops of the walls every night because once this, when, when it comes out of the former, much like the hemp, it's kind of at its most um, vulnerable uh, stage. Once you've got it dry, it's a very, it's a very robust, uh, it's a very robust material. But as at, at optimum moisture content, then um, it is more vulnerable to getting wet. And so you have, you've got to be careful about that. Um, just some decorative stuff that we've done with some flint. The client said, can we just put in some flint like, uh, like the, the cliffs around the corner to Dover have got these layers of flint in and we'd like to just play around with that. So we just played around with it. It's just a surface thing. Probably goes back about 100, 150 mil. Um, so one of the things about uh, energy is that, is that this stuff is quite dense. I mean, this is as dense as we can get it, I should say. So th this, is, uh, this is chalk. It's not as dense as a clay-bound material. This is probably about one and a half tonnes, 1.7 tonnes to the cubic metre. So every, every metre by metre by metre is 1.7 tonnes. So there's quite a lot of mass to it. And what mass does is 
um, it has load-bearing strength, um, but it also has that ability to take up uh, uh, cool and also warmth. So um, in the daytime, it doesn't matter how much sun uh, hits those big glazed sections, the air temperature doesn't rise in the building. The, 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 all of that temperature is locked straight into the, into the mass of the walls. And then the sun goes down on a fairly regular basis, and um, the warmth which is, which is in these walls now comes out to, to, to balance with the, uh, with the air temperature. And so instead of it getting, becoming hotter inside in the day and then cooler at night and then hotter in the day, you'd get this very flat uh, um, uh, temperature, which is much easier to, um, to control than a temperature which is rising and falling. So the, the requirement for mechanical heating and cooling is reduced. So this is about the energy not of the material as you're building, but the energy of the building as it's in use. If you can design a building that you don't need to heat, you will never need to heat it. If you design a building which you need to heat, you'll always have to heat it. So if you think, oh, I'm going to have this building for the next 50 years or for the next 500 years, and I have to heat it, I'm going to have to provide the heat for that building for the next 500 years. Or, the, or, or cool. More energy is, is used in London to cool buildings as of... 2006 than to heat London, which is pretty extraordinary thought. And to me, that's just poor architecture. They're just not using basic forces of physics like mass and insulation to make a, sh make a shell which just works. It's, it, it, it isn't rocket science, right? It's something a bit simpler than that. Uh, so there you can see the green roof in place. So there's, there's quite, you know, there's a reasonable amount of load on those walls, given that they are crushing at this uh, incredibly um, small um, um, strength, low strength. So, uh, so um, West Sussex, uh, East um, uh, East Kent. This is uh, a series of classroom blocks in. Um, um, in East Sussex for the local council. This is, a, uh, this is Plumpton Agricultural College. And um, this is clay-bound round earth. A lot of round earth is clay-bound. Chalk is a bit of a, a, an oddity, but um, it's just worth showing because you've got a lot of it around here. And so I'm just going to go through these quite quickly because um, these stood up and I've got loads more to say. But just to say that this... These classroom blocks were built uh, uh, using the passive house design system, so uh, they should be somewhere around 10 watts per square meter to to uh, heat and light, um, and um, and they're all say local authority classrooms. So again, public buildings in this case that uh, children will be exposed to earth as a structural medium and uh, therefore won't necessarily feel that concrete is the only answer to, to building as they, get, as they grow up. So I just wanted to talk a little bit more about context because um, there's a lot of context at the moment in the UK and context is, is about how I can get my building built. Okay? And since I don't sell a product, um, I'm selling more of an idea. This is kind of up to you whether you pick it up and use it or you don't. But if you do pick it up and use it, you, you need the other tools around to be able to um, uh, to be able to take it to your local planner or your local building control officer to deal with the engineer or the architect, all of these other kinds of issues. So this was our first attempt at a how to do it. And this was actually based... Um, uh, on Africa, because that's where I spent my first 15 years doing earth structures. And it turned into the Zimbabwe standard. Now, Zimbabwe may see a long, seem a long way away from you, but in the standards world, it's just part of the family. Okay? So, uh, Zimbabwe has a standard for round earth structures, and it was published in 2001. And I worked away at that uh, from about 2007 in their local regional economic community. Like, we have the EU, they have SADEC which is 15 countries, and um, in 2012 it was published, the Zimbabwe standard was published as uh, a standard um, 
by SADC, by the whole 15 countries. There's about 460 million people covered in that area who previously were not allowed to build schools and clinics uh, using the material around them. And um, this connects to things like this, which is the American ASTM on design for earth and wall building system. So the Americans have a standard, but we don't have a standard. We don't have a national standard. And so it's uh, something that I'm working on at the moment with British standards to, to make a British standard. Because whether you use it or not, just the fact that it exists make it, makes it easier to say to somebody, yeah, there is a national standard for this. Um, and so to that end, we uh, wrote the design and construction guidelines um, which, again, it's not a national standard, but it's the basis for what could become a national standard for uh, Rand Earth specifically. And in the meantime, it has um, sort of taken its own life to itself, and it's the basis of the BREEAM, the energy standard for, uh, in this case, external wall building materials, Rand Earth and chalk as an A-plus material. And it's also the basis of the national building specification, so architects um, on the RIBA National Building Specification System can pull down specification for, uh, for uh, structures. And actually, um, we were building with Duncan Baker Brown two years ago, and the architect, Duncan Baker Brown, said to the contractor, you need a bit of money, it's in the National Building Specification, it says you need a little bit of money put to the one side for testing of material. This would be an absolutely standard thing for casting concrete, say. But actually, it's the first time that an architect has used the specification to tell the contractor what to do, rather than me having to do it, which is great. It's a, it's a big uh, step forward for us. And um, we have a national uh, body, Earth Building UK, as I mentioned earlier on, um, earthbuildinguk.uk.com. Please write that down. Please go and uh, uh, like us on Facebook. Please go and um, look up the various events which are happening. As a national body, we can um, cooperate with national bodies in European countries to write training standards. As I say, most of what I do is dug up on site, and therefore the training of people is the really important thing. And if somebody trains on a site that I'm working on and then goes back to France, they want to have a little ticket that says, yes, they've done a bit of training in the UK and it covers this. Or likewise, if you went to Germany, say, or, or Portugal, and you did a little bit of work, and you did a little bit of training, you'd want to be able to show that experience and bring it back to the UK and say, yes, I have that experience. And it's, um, so that's the, these are the kinds of things we're working on. Uh, there's already uh, um, training standards for clay plasters, which is a really fast-growing bit of, our, of the clay bit of, of construction. And um, you can go to the Pirate website, um, and you can download that stuff uh, for free today. Earth becomes slowly something that people recognise, although maybe a, th a third of people in the world live in an Earth structure, it's still somehow invisible. Um, but UNESCO have recognised that it exists. It's not just stone or other buildings. Um, we use social media, uh, obviously, to put information out there and there's a lot more of that kind of stuff. Testing, not going to talk about this. Fabric form work, not going to talk about this. Um, a French system of demonstrating the properties and properties of clay and sand and water. And I'm next week I'm in Scotland training with, these, with this French system for the first time. We're going to be showing it at Vision, uh, a, a um, environmental building show in June and then again at our um, uh, annual conference and this year four years uh, four days of workshops at Clayfest. Go to the EBUK website and look for Clayfest. It's going to be four days of workshops which includes turf building from Iceland, cob building from Ireland, uh, clay plaster finishes from Arizona, a whole wide range of stuff. Quite an exciting uh, uh, thing we do once a year. This you probably recognise stands outside there, a bit of uh, temporary building with some rubbish that someone was throwing away. We run workshops um, uh, at, the, um, at the Brighton Airship with um, 
with uh, Bryn actually for the first time this year. I've been doing this, I think I've been doing this for about eight or nine years with you guys. Probably, yeah. Um, which is just a very enjoyable kind of way to work out some of these things. This is October, uh, and normally it's normally sunny in October. Um, these are the these are the trainees and students that were building the wall uh, at the waste house. <clears throat> this is a crazy thing that we built. Sixteen people over over two weeks. It's all hand ran in chalk just outside Lewis. The end. Thank you very much. Thank you.